uh, really remains for me to introduce um, Steve Eliopoulos from Rosenden Electric and Dan Vlamis. Uh, you know, so Steve um, is a very knowledgeable bloke, but I, I, I like to try and include something that is, is not necessarily about tech or serious stuff. And one thing you should know about Steve, if you like, we try and find a, a fun fact. He has created an, uh, an internal cat garden with, um, with all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, apparatus and, and lots of catnip. So his, his cats live in a total state of, uh, I guess, I don't know, do we, do we use the phrase being goofed? <laughs> it keeps them relaxed. <laughs> um, but uh, Steve is anything but that. So, and then Dan, of course, you've already been introduced to him. Uh, one of the founders of Vlamis. Um, and if you know the Vlamis, they're sort of uh, almost like a, 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 a sort of mafia family that has been with Oracle for yeah many, many years. So um, Dan and Steve are going to take us through Rosalind's journey from OBIE to OAC and ADW. With that, I'll switch off for now. Happy hunting, guys. Thank you, Roger. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, Rosenden's journey from OBIEE to OAC. Uh, and I'm um, joined by Steve. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Make sure your mic's on. Thanks for Thanks, joining. Tom. Okay. Um, hey, before, before we get into the meat of things, I just wanted to set the stage a little bit on uh, what we're going to talk about. We'll do introductions. But um, I wanted to put this right up front. We found as we've worked with various clients that uh, this, um, pe many of our clients find that they really want to start with uh, doing predictive analytics. But what we find is that uh, we've adapted this from Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. You have to start first with clean, accurate data. Uh, and build up via governance process with consistency and trust on this. And once you've established that framework, you're really then, uh, people have the confidence in the data to allow you to aggregate and use conformed dimensions uh, and put everything together. And finally, you get the comparisons and visualizations that are meat of what people think of in analytic systems and business intelligence systems. And only once you do all that, should you really embark finally on the AI and machine learning? Without that established base, and that's why it's drawn as a pyramid that you have, then really people don't care about the upper level. And you'll see that's a theme in this presentation. I wanted to put that right up front as kind of a theme for today's uh, presentation. Uh, with that, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Valama software. I think people may be familiar. We're very proud of uh, having our expertise in Oracle Cloud Platform Business Analytics. Uh, and we've developed, developed all sorts of BI and analytics systems. This is what we do. This is why we're passionate about, um, about uh, A and D O U C in that. Done all sorts of stuff. Um, but I'll turn things over to Steve to uh, kind of introduce you a little more to what Rosenden does. Steve? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, Rosenden is a, uh, is a large electrical subcontractor. Uh, we're nationwide. Um, we're a little bit unique in the fact that we're actually uh, employee owned. Um, so everybody tends to have uh, a little bit of a stake in the company. Um, we do tend to focus on kind of three main areas of, of buildings. Um, we've got data centers, which have been very popular lately. Um, we've got big commercial style, uh, commercial residential buildings, um, either hotels or, or big office buildings. Um, and we do a lot of stadiums too. Um, this is, uh, our stadium over in San Francisco for the Warriors, um, that I was actually in, uh, from the ground floor up on. Um, so that was a little near and dear to me. Um, but yeah, we do a lot of big projects, um, again, nationwide. Um, we're approaching about 3 billion a year. Um, so we're, we're fairly big. We've got about 7,000 employees. Um, and lately the upper management has changed a little bit. A few folks have retired and we've got some, some young blood in there that are, are looking for more analytics. Everybody wants, you know, more access to data and, and to be able to use that data. Um, 
and a little bit of a of, of a background for what we were doing previously. Um, we had we had a legacy OPIEE system um, that we called dashboards. Um, Technically, you know, if you go back and look at it now, we can say that they weren't real dashboards. Um, they were kind of what our, our guys were used to more uh, uh, um, in terms of more Excel based stuff and more tabular data that really, you know, there's no there's no graphical interpretations. There was no um, there's not much organization of the data even. Um, it was really just more or less spreadsheets in OBIEE um, that they were using. Um, and that's what they were used to. Um, and so when we've got, you know, we had a little bit of a, a shakeup in our in our sea uh, level hierarchy. Um, they said, hey, we've got all this data. Let's let's try and use it. Um, so we also, oh, another important fact is is our physical servers we're starting to near their end of life. Um, and so we had this predicament of, do we, uh, you know, make this investment in our, in our physical hardware, or do we try and upgrade to get some, you know, some newer technology that may help a little bit more. Um, and, and that aspect of it really made the switch to OAC uh, a lot more financially or finance financially, uh, uh, reasonable for us. Um, it made it a lot more enticing. Um, but at the same time, you know, after we made that decision to, to make the upgrade to OAC, we realized that our current data structure um, was nowhere near where it needed to be. Um, and, you know, we realized that was probably tying into some of the issues that we were seeing in OBIEE, um, where we had some very limited uh limited success in our in in, in our um, basically our, our ability to put out clean and accurate data first of all so not only were these not real traditional or, or true dashboards with any kind of of analytics or um or any graphs or anything visual um we, we on top of that we had data issues um, prior to even migrating into oac um, we've had several different offshore consultancy companies um, try to get their hands on this and, and to more or less fix what we had. Um, and it was, it was just a, a, a pretty monumental struggle. Um, not only just, and this was before the whole COVID labor uh, shortage happened, um, it was tough finding guys. Um, that were really qualified in OAC. Uh, granted, this was a couple of years ago. OAC was a little newer than it is today, um, but <clears throat> it was it, it was not easy for us. Um, you know, we've, there's a bullet here. We had a, re a revolving door of OAC people. Um, a lot of them had extensive OBIEE experience, um, but what we found was you really need somebody with with OAC knowledge and expertise. Um, you know, really more than a couple of years would be ideal. Um, you know, Vlamis has been doing it for quite a while, um, and that was quite a difference from from what we had been, been uh, getting prior to that. Um, <clears throat> I hope we can go on to the next slide, unless you have anything to add, Dan. That's fine. Go through the uh, what you what you found where you were. In October, I'm sorry. What was that? Go, go ahead and through go through what you saw your needs were in October of 2020. Ah, uh, so basically, so yeah, like I said, we had new uh, new CEOs, new uh, new C level management, and they wanted us to be more modern. They wanted our our you know basically our business decision makers um, to have a more modern uh, way to get their data and to potentially to be looking at that data more frequently was the, uh, was the idea. Um, we had been just emailing out more or less reports weekly 
Um, we wanted to get our guys to look at data on a more daily or more regular basis. Um, and we wanted them to be able to look at something and not have to do as much digging uh, to find what was actually wrong with the job than they were. Um, rather than, you know, look through just pages of Excel and just tag their data, um, we wanted to have something that would draw their eyes somewhere. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, like I mentioned, you know, end users had, had lost confidence a little bit uh, with our data integrity. Um, and again, this is before we even thought about putting any visualizations on top of it. It's just the, the data aspect in our database was was all messed up. We had a couple of different folks in there, um, like I mentioned, trying to trying to get it updated, and and we're just really struggling with with accuracy there. Um, so we asked our Oracle sales reps, like, hey, you know, you, you gave us this really good pitch for OAC. You know, we've hired a couple of different companies worth of people um, to try and develop this, and I mean, nobody's really been able to get what we saw in our original pitch. Um, <clears throat> and so our CIO eventually went back to the Oracle sales guys and, and told them kind of straight up, you know, find me somebody what you guys or so, find me somebody that can do what you guys, sh you know, showed us and promised us in your sales pitch or, or we're going to go find somewhere else. Um, and that's when they finally, uh, they finally introduced us to Vlamis. Um, okay. Then uh, a little bit of what we had worked on together. Uh, go ahead. So we had done a little bit with OAC. Uh, we, I want to say we're about a year and a half or two years in before we kind of reached a, a stopping point and, and reevaluated what, what resources we were using. Um, we were focusing a lot on financial dashboards. Um, and kind of executive level dashboards that were important for our business, but at the same time, really only meant for a handful of people. Um, like I said, we've got a, you know seven thousand or so uh, employees, and the vast majority of them were not using these one or two dashboards that were for you know finance or execs. So, um, with the help of Flamis, we kind of realized that. And took a step back and started to focus on more, you know, what what's going to benefit us the most, you know, initially, um, and realized that was more where our project managers uh, were getting all their information from, um, which was the the vast majority of our end user base. Um, so what we did was we started off with a little support contract, um, which I would recommend uh, just as a general practice. Um, which we probably should have done before we got to Flamis. Um, <clears throat> and that may have helped save some time. But basically what we did was, hey, you know, can you fix a couple of these um, kind of quick punch list items that we have had lingering that our developers couldn't fix? Um, and we started that as kind of a test for Flamis to make sure that they could really do what, what they and Oracle was promising. Um, and so we did... I, th I think we ended up giving them a three or four with a couple of, hey, if you finish this, can you do these also? And, and we ended up getting all seven done. Um, so that was impressive and really gave us some confidence to, to move, start moving forward and doing some real projects with Flamis. Um, let's see. So the next thing we did was our, our billings dashboard, which although it does kind of fit in with the, the finance aspect, it, it is also available and widely used by our project managers uh, as well. So they can see exactly what kind of costs are hitting their projects. Um, <clears throat> and we rebuilt it in Classic as kind of a quick win um, because we already had an OBIE, it was fairly tabular. Um, and they just added some quick graphs and basically made it a little quicker and easier to navigate through. Um, and, and a little bit more accessible. Um, and that was a, that was a very uh, kind of a quick win for us. Um, then we went on to the install rate dashboard, uh, which we <clears throat> basically put out to, to figure out which you know, type of installers were the best at their specific um, uh, type of, of work. Um, like I mentioned, we do various different types. We've got 
you know, hotels to, to stadiums. We've got big solar and wind projects too. And they're all different. Um, <clears throat> they all require different skill sets. So some folks are really good at installing this, you know, certain type of wire or a certain type of conduit. Um, and we'll put those guys on certain jobs. Um, the problem was with a lot of our requests from our, our higher ups is the requests themselves tend to be somewhat half-baked. Um, and we'll start working on, on a request. We'll go back to the C levels and we'll say, Hey, look, this is what we've got so far. And they'll say, Oh, that's great. But <clears throat> could you do X, Y, and Z? Um, and that process is really, really difficult, um, to end up basically going back halfway through your project and having to rescope it. Um, and really we were almost done with the project when, uh, when we identified this, this new request. Um, so again, really, really important to get all of these details from your C levels before you start working on the project. So A, you can budget accordingly um, because this put us well over budget on this project. Um, and B, so you can have a reasonable expectation of timeline turnaround. Um, you know, originally they wanted monthly data, which was normal for us. We were used to getting everything in monthly. Um, and then they go, oh, this is great, but we really wanted to see it in a, in a weekly format. So then we had to go back and rebuild a bunch of a bunch of stuff, and it, it took a lot longer than we initially anticipated. Um, and so, and part of the problem was not having really a, a subject matter expert that could kind of retort, you know, or, or rebuttal to the to the sea levels and say, "Hey, you know, if you ask for this, this is going to take a lot longer." Um, and to have somebody say that with confidence um, really helps in general. Um, let's see. Does that sound about right, Dan? Yeah, yeah that's that? great. Let's go on. And so tell us a little bit about some of the benefits that you've achieved, especially on the project uh, that, you know, how has this impacted uh, Rosenden? So it's, yeah, I mean, benefits. Um, we were able to not need to reinvest in outdated technology. Um, so that saved us money right out of the gate. Um, the other big ask from from our business was, hey, we want this, you know, we want our our data to be easily accessible um, and to be accessible at a reasonable pace. Um, so one of our big things was we want improved in performance. Um, and part of that was not only just upgrading our technology, but remodeling our our subject areas and and having somebody at a high level take a look and and make sure we're not we don't have duplicate subject areas that are slightly different in other places uh, making it easier for users to to create their own ad hoc reporting um, that's a big ask um, that we weren't really able to do before because of how, how jumbled our stuff was um, <clears throat> uh, redesigning is a big one you know like i mentioned we had kind of quote unquote dashboards um, now we've got you know, much better visuals, much easier to see, um, and everything is somewhat interactive. We can we can more or less drill down into anything we really need to see detail in. Um, and I think one of the one of the keys here is also being able to use the ad hoc capabilities of the data visualization. We did end up redoing some of the dashboards using those ad hoc capabilities and to change the look and feel of those dashboards. We'll get into that a little more and show some of that. All right, and then uh, go ahead, a couple more things. Um, so then, uh, so yeah, we, we basically gave these guys access to more on-demand uh, weekly level data. So, um, you know, before they were waiting for reports to be emailed out to them on a weekly basis. Now we've built that into the new system where they can go in and pull, you know, this week's report, last week's report, whatever. Um, and that was, uh, that was another big ask that they didn't want to have to wait for IT to go in and run a report for them. They wanted just to have it on demand. Um, and so that was a big, big improvement. Um, also helped our you know kind of our internal 
upper management be more confident about our data um, and our ability to, to produce consistent numbers. Um, we had a, an incident a while back where you know, one of our finance guys pulled some data from a slightly different subject area that didn't have everything that, that he thought was in there. Um, and he made a, a bad business decision that was off by $40 million. Um, you know, just because something was mislabeled more or less. Um, so that's the type of thing we're trying to, uh, trying to avoid. Um, and now we can have this, you know, similar situation, a super user go in and he's able to pull an ad hoc report and be confident that the data is correct. <clears throat> um, on top of that, because we've restructured our, our database a little bit and, you know, obviously in, in improved our technology, um, the speed and usability is, is vastly increased in general. Um, and then from a, a personal perspective, you know, our, our business users have more confidence that IT can actually uh, deliver a consistent product um, and, and deliver results in a timely manner, uh, which was really, we were really struggling with before Lamus. Thanks, Steve. So one of the things that uh, Rosenden had asked us for was kind of an a OAC assessment. And uh, just to give you a sense of the framework and the ways that you all can assess your projects as well, we evaluated on what we call the six C's, content of what the dashboards were producing, comparison measures, uh, choice, giving people the ability to use prompts to change what they're looking at, categorization, looking at things in categories, connection to the data, and then the context, which is what those comparisons provide. Uh, we did redesigned the executive KPI and some other dashboards as well, uh, the key performance indicators for the executives uh, we made in this document that we produced uh, several UI suggestions, specific suggestions. We suggested some new comparison measurements. Uh, we believe in having comparisons, not just reporting the data, but giving context for that data. Uh, and then some additional graphs because it's easier to compare these data using uh, comparative and you see it visually when you see the graphs. And you'll see some examples of that. Uh, another finding, uh, just so you all can take this uh, to your own projects, move the calculations in the, into the RPD. There is a real tendency to do the calculations in the individual report. Those become more and more complex. And then that's what leads to people misunderstanding what's in the data. We suggest moving that into what's called the RPD layer, not in the report logic, because that gets gummed up and it leads to poor performance. Uh, organize yeah, and, the column and names, Dan, but, just but, just to add to that real quick, uh, especially if you're if you're using a uh, like a like a consultant group that is maybe just being brought in for something real quick, they'll they're probably going to default to putting it putting all the calculations inside the report logic because yeah. that's all they're seeing right at, at a at a near level. Um, but it's important to kind of take a step back and and remind them that you know this is a bigger dashboard or our operation than, than just this one little page. So something to keep in mind. Can I take this interruption as well? I mean, just, I yep. think it sort of matches this. One of your C's is, is connection. And I've got a question here, which I thought probably would be sensible now is what are the systems or applications of source data and what ETL tools are being used to manage DW? You want to take that, Steve? Yeah, so we're, we're using ODI uh, to connect our EBS database. Um, oh, and we've actually recently, and I think it's, we've got this on a, a, a slide somewhere yeah, down the road. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll wait to elaborate on that yeah, a little bit. we'll talk more about that. Uh, and then organizing the column names to make them more usable. There's a tendency to just dump the column names in there and often alphabetical. Uh, and if you organize them, people can find things more easily. Think about what the names are of this. These are all some of the suggestions and the performance needs to be improved. The system was not as usable as it would be, especially for ad hoc. And there are lots of suggestions um, in the document that are Rosadin specific. Um, for some of the performance issues, uh, we migrated what they had, but the performance in many areas was just not good. Uh, and we found that needed to really redesign the data model. Things have changed over the years uh, and they weren't using summary tables. 
most of the analyses were using an attribute of the customer dimension. And as a result, they had to go down to the lowest level data to pull the data. So they, the queries were not using the summary uh, tables. And uh, the RPD was coded with a left outer join that somebody had decided years ago needed to be done. And uh, then when you scale it, it just didn't perform with a large customer dimension using a big join and surprise, surprise, the performance was not very good on that. Uh, the interesting, you start talking to users about this, they didn't care. <laughs> so they just want it fixed. <laughs> they don't care about the details. They don't care that they're asking for something that somebody else didn't spec. Uh, and this is the story that Steve told before where they just pull in the wrong data and off by $40 million. So uh, some of the technologies that were used in this, this is getting to what uh, Roger was asking about uh, ADW for storing the data, simply a faster database uh, getting at that. And we'll talk about this more, uh, the ability to kind of self tune itself. Um, ODI to move the data from e-business suite and a legacy Oracle database, we had to move all that to ADW and OAC, of course, to present the data, migrating the uh, dashboards that were there, as well as creating new dashboards uh, for this. Um, in terms of how ADW was used, uh, it was used faster. And the concept here was to have less maintenance of the ADW, less of the need for a full-time DBA uh, for this. Uh, we migrated from the Oracle database to the ADW that allowed them to retire some old hardware. We also, um, Rosenden modified the data model at the same time. We assisted a bit with that. Um, in hindsight, maybe we should have either um, modified it completely and redone it or don't make any modifications. The concept of just a little bit of modification uh, made it hard to do comparisons and you kind of get not as much of the benefit of totally redoing things. Uh, they're now on the cloud. And then uh, Steve, I think you had some things with ADW that you guys found. I'll let you go ahead and talk to that. Yeah, so ADW is great. Um, it's a little faster. Uh, it, you know, it's definitely much more autonomous um, than just a, a regular data warehouse. But as the name implies, you know, it, it sounds like it's 100% autonomous. It, it's not. Um, you do need somebody at least available, maybe not full time, um, but you need somebody that knows ADW and has experience with it and will know the pitfalls that are coming. Um, we've had a couple of uh, cases that it, it hasn't um, automatically increased resources. Um, so, you know, definitely keep an eye on it. Don't just assume that because it has autonomous in the, in the name that it's 100% you know, autonomous. So just, just a little caveat there. It helps, but keep an eye on it. Yes. So, okay. Um, all right. And then uh, ODI, um, regarding that, they had been using ODI to move the data into the uh, data warehouse. Uh, and they started using that uh, instead of Informatica, really mostly, Steve, if I recall, to save on license cost. Uh, right. Informatica had gotten the, uh, more expensive uh, in doing this. And so ODI made a lot of sense uh, for them. Uh, we did extend that model to migrate the data. And uh, Steve mentioned about the, uh, for the install rate dashboard, one of the things we did was take the monthly data model and extend it to load the data weekly because partway through the project, we found out the users especially wanted to look at weekly level data. That's what the key requirement. And frankly, I think we all missed that a little bit, maybe a little bit of a plug for doing some of the requirements analysis up front to understand what's the data you need at what grain. Uh, and that became important in the project and uh, something we had to uh, look back and uh, change some things. Um, and then again, there were some issues. Um, and go ahead with those, Steve, I'll let you speak to those. Um. <clears throat> Let's see. So, well, I mean, oh, you know, yeah, we're talking about the issues with ODI. So the issues, so, and this is re re pretty recent, um, but something we'd run into when we first started working with uh, Vlamis actually a, a while ago 
Um, our one of our teams has been used to working with the online version, um, the marketplace ODI, um, which supposedly is just as fast as the desktop version. Um, come to find out recently that maybe that isn't always the case. Um, I, I'm not sure if it has something to do with everybody working from home um, or or what, but it, you know, if if the marketplace ODI is taking significantly longer, I, you know, we'd highly recommend downloading the the desktop version for for improvement of speed. Um, we were having trouble even getting keystrokes in without lag, so. Um, just just a, a quick heads up on that one. Yeah, and we're still just to be fair. We're also look, still looking into that with the differences on that, and still doing some investigation. But we kind of be believe in being open with the community about what we're looking into, and this is what we're finding right now. This is an ongoing investigation on that. Uh, then using OAC, uh, you know, we found the front end. We're using the data visualization front end for the new business cases. Uh, and using DV for, especially for that ad hoc use. Um, some of the things that, uh, as we talk to some of the users, they're having trouble creating ad hoc reports just for the as, as, average user. Mostly not anything to do with the tool. Uh, it's really because the Rosenden data model has grown over the years. This is what we find in many projects. And you have to understand the data structures uh, and so trying to use junior level um, <clears throat> computer savvy people to produce the ad hoc reports kind of works, but you got to know something about the data model when that is brought over from a complex OBIE system. Uh, we try to actually simplify things as we go, and um, it's tough to do when it's a, a legacy implementation. Um, and uh, I'll let you talk to uh, Rosenden people getting used to OAC. Anything on that, Steve? Yeah, um, we, I mean, we've had some positive feedback, but you know they they still kind of have a little bit of a bad taste in their in their mouths from from OBIE, to be honest. Um, yeah, you know it's we've had a couple of of small snags. Um, you know we're we're still in process of developing, so as we're growing out our our system, you know we've had a few growing pains, um, but, you know, largely they're, they're pretty happy with, with what they've been seeing. Um, but at the same time, you know, not, not entirely sold yet. Um, like Dan said, we were still, we, we haven't done too much DV yet. Um, and that's really what they were sold in their sales pitch a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, we, in, in, you know, in, in OAC's defense, we have we had a lot of custom uh, custom stuff that wasn't very easy just to do a straight migration for. Um, and that's part of the reason we we rebuilt. Um, and the other part was because what we had was not fantastic to begin with, so we didn't really want to bring over um, a, a bunch of jumbled up backend data into into OAC. Um, and then there were some data issues that were holding back the project. Uh, in you know, we one of the things is we ended up uh, they ended up rebuilding instead of just migrating. Uh, in hindsight, do it all the way or don't do it. Uh, doing it a little bit was not as um, as preferred in this case. Uh, some of the ETL processes, just to let you know, this story is not totally done yet. We're still working on it. Uh, they're still not right. Uh, and some of this is a little bit maybe in the uh, ETL process and in the data architecture, too many cooks in the kitchen uh, on this. So um, we're trying to move on. I see some questions have come in. I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for doing that. On the install rate dashboard, it was a major overhaul of the former dashboard. It seemed like it would be simple, uh, but there were complications in the grain of the data. Uh, and we talked about that before, how to handle uh, cumulative for totals versus discrete weekly. Let me just show you an example of this is what we're talking about. This is where um, you can look at the install rate, which is, uh, Steve, how many basically think of this as feet of conduit that are being installed in a large complex stadium. Uh, and you, they're looking at it by all sorts of different breakout dimensions. And one of the things we do is try and sort those, you can see, in order instead of putting in alphabetical order. 
And so this is what people run their business on is the install rate of these, that type of thing. I can see another example, you're looking at that same install rate. And we talked before about the importance of comparison measures. That's where we're looking at this on a, uh, the install rate on the uh, estimated uh, versus the actual install on here uh, in a scatter plot, look at it or a table of data. And we, people still want their table of data. So we often include that and looking at it by division uh, and the variance from what was expected, that type of thing. Anything else to add on here, Steve? Yeah, so for example, like we would have had just this top right corner section as our entire dashboard before. It's like that would, that would be it with a few more columns. Um, and now we can have, you know, we've got this visual representation. We can see the outliers pretty clearly. We can click on them, we can drill down into them, see who's, who's not doing well, who's doing great, um, you know, at, at, at a pretty quick high level. So then, you know, the, the, the other thing we found is that people are still getting used to this. We come back to that uh, analytic hierarchy of needs. I'll just build this out. We talked about this before, starting with clean, accurate data, having a governance process to establish consistency and trust on it, aggregating, conforming the dimensions, and then we're into the comparisons of visualizations. Uh, ideally, you would do everything from the beginning, but I will point out that we end up using some of the visualizations to find the issues in the data. Uh, everybody thinks it's okay until you start putting analytics on top of it. And that's when you discover all of that. And I think we really haven't fully gotten into the AI and machine learning yet, and probably rightfully so until we, uh, until we get some of these um, issues resolved on that. So at this point, they're looking at uh, you know, increasing the adoption, uh, executing some of the suggestions and using AI and machine learning uh, going down the road uh, for this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get to the, some of the questions rather than some of this, Steve, if that's okay. Uh, and we have contact information here as well for us. Feel free to reach out to uh, either of us on this. Uh, but uh, Roger, I see some things coming in. Uh, if you want, I'll just uh, go through these. Uh, yeah, there's four, there's four questions there, Dan. Um, that Go ahead. Uh, and they seem, uh, they seem that they're, they're probably you guys will answer them in your sleep. So, um, did you um, are you still happening to use the governance model using the admin tool with RPD? It's question one. And that comes so, from. So, I think they mean the governance plugin, uh, and if that's what they're talking about, we are not using the governance uh, plugin. Um, and otherwise, I don't know what they mean by the governance model using the admin tool. Okay, yeah, sometimes so that's Steve. Steve's typing something as well, okay. so. Yeah. yeah, I don't think so. Okay, so okay. no. Um, go ahead, Roger. Okay, so the next one was, again, from Srinath as well, just saying why not use the online data modelers that are part of OAC? And I guess so I think a lot of that is the online the online data modeler. We think of it as the thin client modeler. Uh, if we're talking about the same one, uh, and uh, with Rosen, and they had a huge investment in this RPD file brought over from OBIEE, uh, and I believe you can't mix and match those. So that's why not the online data uh, the thin client modeler. It's because they they were legacy bring brought over from OBIEE. Right. And then we've got another question from Ashok Moduli. Uh, while moving the RPD, why do you need to change the logic in OAC as these are nothing to do with upgrading or migrating OBIE to OAC? And I think the answer is fairly similar to the last one, actually. Of course, performance you can improve in a different way. As a so I'll answer, I'll let Steve correct me. Um, I think in many ways, maybe we, we didn't, why did we need to change? I think it was more of a, sure, while we're at it, why don't uh, we go ahead and change this? In hindsight, I'm not sure that was the best decision, uh, just to be quite frank uh, about this. Maybe we should not have changed uh, the logic. Agreed, you don't have to change the logic. We thought, well, let's just change this. And then that caused some of the problems. Fair enough, Steve? Yep, yep, agreed. Yeah. Okay. And there's a question from Sahil Vijay. He said, how do we validate the artifacts between OAC and OBIE 11G? 
we had BVT tool for comparison when upgrading from 11G to 12C? Yeah, I think that BV tool is baseline validation tool. Uh, and you know, Steve, maybe you can help. I don't know how we did the comparison of the artifacts. I think they mean the, uh, the data between them and validate if they were the same. Um, and we actually looked into using baseline validation tool. I think that's something where that uh, was a nice tool. And um, we ended up doing some of that, but we found it easier to just do the comparison directly with um, the, you know, basically putting two screens next to each other type of uh, compare one to the other. Um, and I don't know the BVT, um, maybe we'll pipe that up if Philippe is on and ask him if that works for OAC. I'm not sure it's fully supported for OAC. Yeah. Um, okay, and then there's one more question for you gentlemen, and then uh, we've got 10 minutes till the top of the hour. Which, um, so, um, uh, Michael Ballestero is asking, um, and I think you did actually answer this in the last slide, but uh, uh, I'm not sure when he actually posed this question. No AI or ML implementation yet? Question mark. Um, any initiative or requirement in that corner? Steve, I'm going to let you take that. Yeah, that was that was one of the first things our business asked asked for. Um, but like Dan mentioned earlier, we were still having issues with data integrity that we really need to, to address first. Um, so we're kind of moving from data integrity to maybe playing with some more fancy visualizations in the DV realm. Um, and then next we'll, we'll go and tackle the, the AI ML component. Um, but that's definitely really what we're, what we're looking forward to now at this point. And I think we're going to talk about that later in the, in the tech cast, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I'll handle the last one that just flowed in from Rajesh. Do you, do you migrate RPD to the, new, the OEC environment? It, yes. Is there a plan to move to the new data modeling tool instead of RPD? I would say in general, no. Um, the RPD, for those that haven't heard, uh, I think people have talked about it publicly. There is a, uh, coming out from Oracle a, uh, a UI change. They've talked about it for years of uh, doing data modeling using a, a new UI coming out. And I would say that would in, in, in influence and the RPD file is around uh, and will be, uh, there's some changes coming with that. Um, so as a result, we don't see totally redoing things in the thin client modeler, instead use the RPD. There's such an investment in the Oracle community that will be supported for quite some time, I'm sure. Um, all right. Well, with that, uh, I think um, I'll turn things out back over uh, to, uh, well, I'll just continue well, just on with the other deck. Go ahead, Roger. It remains really yeah, for you to be quiet for a second. and Because yeah. <laughs> you've got your turn coming up again next. And just for me to say thank you very much, gents. Uh, it was interesting to actually hear about the real life issues um, you know, and, and a real life implementation. So thanks, Steve. Uh, really, really good to hear from you. And um, of course, Uncle Dan, as always, thanks, mate. Um, so, uh, and with that, really, we're, we're going to move. Thank you, Steve. We, you, can, um, you can stay on, of course, but uh, your time of being in the spotlight is over for the minute.